Good evening. This is Alex Burden, the Executive Director of the Truman Library Institute, the nonprofit partner of the Truman Presidential Library and Museum located in Independence, Missouri. Thank you for joining us for the next installment of our 75th anniversary programming designed to honor President Harry Truman and his transformational presidency. I reviewed the attendance list for tonight. Uh, it was large, more than 550. And it looks like we've got 250 and climbing for tonight's program. That's wonderful for those of you in Kansas City and Independence. Thanks for joining us. For those of you from ranging from upstate New York to Southern California, uh, concentration of friends in Washington, DC, great to be with you. I look forward to being at a reception and being able to look at a across the crowd and see your smiling face and hopefully we will continue to get closer to that. But tonight is about uh, a very special program we're offering. Uh, proud to be bringing this to you. It's a program focused on the relatively unknown story of Isaac Woodard, a decorated black soldier returning home from service at the end of World War II, who was forcibly removed from a bus, beaten and blinded by law enforcement officers in rural South Carolina. That event occurred in January 1946, almost 75 years ago. Fortunately, this relatively unknown story is getting better known, uh, first and foremost through the great work done by Judge Richard Gergel, who wrote the wonderful book, Unexampled Courage, The Blinding of Sir Sergeant Isaac Woodard and the Awakening of President Truman and Judge Waring. It's a really great book. I recommend you pick it up at the bookstore or order it from Amazon. And also, uh, thanks to the great work that you'll be hearing more about tonight on a yet to be released PBS American Experience film, The Blinding of Isaac Woodard, which premieres tomorrow night. That's right, tomorrow night, Tuesday, March 30th. And I'm really pleased that we, be, we are able to show you a couple of clips, one a teaser for the film, and another a about three minute clip featuring Harry Truman. Um, the Truman Library Institute for its part is proudly telling the story of Truman's civil rights legacy, thanks to the generous support of the Boeing Company in a variety of ways. This includes a civil rights gallery in the new Truman exhibition, which will be opening later this year and high profile programming like tonight's that culminates but doesn't end in July, 2023, when we host a civil rights summit in Washington, DC, in recognition of the 75th anniversary of the DSAG executive order. And speaking of high profile programming, let's get to it. I am very excited about tonight's conversation, which will be moderated by acclaimed journalist, Michelle Norris, who currently writes for the Washington Post and was co-host of NPR's All Things Considered. Joining Michelle on the panel will be Jamila Efron and Professor Carrie Fredrickson. Michelle, Jamila, and Carrie, thank you very much for joining us and for agreeing to participate in tonight's program and for your help in telling this important story. And thank you, our Truman audience, for your continued interest and support and for tuning in for tonight's program. I really hope you enjoy it. Michelle, take it away. Alex, thank you so very much. Thanks to all of you for joining us tonight. You are in for a special treat. Um, we've had a chance to preview this film and this is an important bit of history that many more people will have a chance to learn about. I'm honored to be here with the Truman Library and I'm, um, this is personal for me. My father was a returning veteran. One week before Isaac Woodard was blinded, my father also had an encounter with police officers a few states away in Birmingham, Alabama. He lived to tell that story, although like many veterans, he didn't tell that. So I'm here tonight to represent Belvin Norris, as well as myself, Michelle Norris, and also all the other veterans whose stories are tied to Isaac Woodard. Jamila and Carrie, it is so wonderful to be with you tonight. Jamila, thank you for doing this film. And Carrie, thank you for always elevating this history. 
Jamila, I want you to tell us why this story got under your skin and why you decided to pursue this as a documentary. Well, I think it's part of what gets under your skin about it is the fact that it is so uh, unknown that something like this could happen that actually had a huge role in changing our country's history and that so few of us really knew about it. Um, there's, that's a, that's a wrong to be righted. And so that's the sort of a treat to kind of jump into a story like that and bring to light. Um, but also it, it this, the, the film expands and, and doesn't just tell the story of Isaac Woodard's blinding, but also the impact it had on civil rights law in South Carolina, which ultimately leads to the Brown v. Board of Education decision. And for me, what was also sort of just incredibly exciting about the story is to show how one man just standing up for himself had such a huge impact on, on American history. Carrie, we're gonna hear from you in just a minute, but Jamila, I wonder if we should first, um, let's take a look at the trailer and that will give people a, a sense of grounding in this story. Can we do that? Let's just take a minute to uh, watch this. To a white Southerner in 1946, nothing is more provocative than a black man in uniform. He's brought off a bus and he's hit with a blackjack within moments. It just seemed to be something that shouldn't happen in America. No one can say that what happened to Isaac Woodard was justified. This is not a case that the Justice Department wanted to bring. And at trial, they showed that their heart was not in it. Judge Waring was horrified that he was made part of this travesty. He was emerging as the conscience of the South. Woodard's blinding just seemed to encapsulate other cases of violence against African Americans. They thought it was perfectly normal for a Southern sheriff to get away with blinding a black man. The idea that a war veteran could be attacked and beaten by law enforcement officers surprised Truman and enraged him. And then he turns to his staff and says, my God, we have got to do something. Thurgood Marshall and his legal team are becoming very effective at chipping away at the segregation status quo. He was threatened constantly. His life was always in danger. During a trial, they would have to move him around from house to house. Judge Waring says to Marshall, bring me a frontal challenge to segregation. Marshall's office had files from floor to ceiling of these cases. They are playing for the U.S. Supreme Court. They are building a record for the U.S. Supreme Court. The Supreme Court has rendered a momentous historic decision. Who would have guessed that the blinding of a heroic veteran would be the beginning of the end of Jim Crow in America? Powerful film. And I hope you all will watch it tomorrow. Carrie, I must say that I was embarrassed upon doing research for a book I wrote 10 years ago uh, when I learned about my father's story, embarrassed that I didn't know more about the plight of returning black veterans mm -hmm. after World War II, and embarrassed that I had never heard of the Isaac Woodard case until I started doing research on the large number of returning veterans who were met with violence after participating in a fight for democracy overseas and returning and expecting that they might get a taste of it back home when America wasn't ready. Could you set the stage for us and help us understand what the world was like for returning Black veterans in the winter of 1946? The South in 1946 for returning Black veterans was a land of promise and a land of peril, um, as it always had been. Um, as in World War I, um, African-American soldiers, North and South, um, closed ranks and decided, okay, even though we do not have democracy at home, we will go and fight for democracy at, abroad. Um, after World War I, um, that, uh, that hope was not realized. 
Um, that hypocrisy again arises in World War II. Um, and this time there's a definite effort um, to bring the war home um, in a positive way, to come home and fight for democracy at home. Um, the NAACP's membership in the South grows exponentially. It was dangerous to be an NAACP member in the South, um, yet 1,200 chapters are created during World War II. When these men come home, um, they are determined to achieve democracy at home. And so it is no surprise that, especially in 1946, when we have uh, midterm elections, that early voting rights efforts are being led, not just by veterans, but by veterans in uniform. Um, for white Southerners, the war was, um, it was a time, it was a transformative time. Um, and it's transformative for them for many reasons, but because the black people in their midst are suddenly unloosed, right? They are, men are leaving to go to the military, whole families, whole communities are moving to the North to take jobs. Um, on the one hand, some white Southerners are happy to see them go. On the other hand, who's going to do the work, right? And so for white Southerners, 1946 is a time of, you know what, we need to redraw that line. And so you have these men returning with plans for the future and a determination and, um, you know, some training in weaponry, right? Who are not going to, they're, they're going to stand up for their rights. And so 1946, month after month after month after month, if you read um, not just black newspapers, but you get this coverage in, in white newspapers as well, confrontation after confrontation after confrontation involving um, black veterans, Sim you know, simply trying to exercise the rights that they had fought and many had died for um, overseas. And Jamila, if anyone who has seen someone return from the military knows that their bearing is different, they come back, they hold their shoulders a little bit differently. They walk with a certain purpose and pride. And this was happening for, for black men who were not allowed at that point any kind of agency or authority. Um, help us understand what happened on the bus that night. Isaac Woodard is in uniform. He has money in his pocket, a whole lot of money, especially for 1946. What happened that evening? Well, he's an hour away from his homecoming after three hours, uh, three years abroad serving in the, in the South Pacific. And he, he needs to use the restroom um, back at, Back then, Greyhound buses did not have restroom facilities, and so it was company policy when a passenger needed to go, they should be allowed to disembark. And he asked and was, was spoken to very disrespectfully by the bus driver who called him boy and told him to sit back down. And Isaac Woodard had been changed by his service and said, don't speak to me like that, speak to me like a man, I'm a man just like you, and affirmed himself as someone worthy of respect equal at that to the bus driver, which in the deep south late at night was, you know, he had to know on some level it was a risky decision, but he he couldn't go back to the status quo after, after his time and experiences abroad. He had been given two medals while he was serving. So he was, he, he was a man who had a, a reasonable amount of pride and dignity at this moment. Um, the bus driver, pulls off at the next town, brings some police officers aboard who almost immediately pull Woodard off the bus and begin beating him with a blackjack, which is a spring-loaded baton that's incredibly painful to be struck in the head with. And they were striking him in the head, eventually culminating in the officer uh, inserting the blackjack forcefully into both of Isaac Woodard's eye sockets. Um, pretty much instantaneously blinding him. After this uh, happened, the case made its way to the civil rights community and eventually to Harry Truman. Um, and Harry Truman was quite upset by this. And the case became uh, a really a cause celeb. There were several people who 
were willing to sign their name to this cause, not just to raise money for Isaac Woodard, um, who was who at that point was denied his his pension because it didn't he wasn't wounded in the in military service, um, but also in the case for civil rights. What was was happening in that moment, and why, of all the cases that happened, because there were uh, people who were beaten, blowtorched, uh, castrated, shot. I mean, hung. Horrible things were happening to veterans all across America, and in particularly the South. Why was it the Isaac Woodard case? that gained, why was it that Isaac Woodard and his case gained so much attention? Well, you know, the circumstances of his attack were so um, just unmistakably wrong to their core. This is a man in uniform, the night of his discharge, medals on his chest, and he's treated this way after coming back from fighting a war for democracy and human rights. So the, the plain hypocrisy of that was, was part of why I think President Truman was so affected by his story. Um, but, you know, the NAACP had been looking for cases like this to crystallize the reality of racism and, and violence in the South, in the Jim Crow South particularly. <clears throat> and there were loads of examples, but what was unique about Isaac Woodard is that he was alive mm -hmm. to tell his story, mm -hmm. to testify to what happened to him and, he had the evidence of the crime had, that had been done against him on his face. There was no disputing what had happened to him. Yeah, Michelle, could I jump in here? Of course. Okay, yeah, I mean, I think, I think that he is this living, breathing, walking, talking example of Southern brutality is certainly um, uh, key to uh, how this, this gains so much notoriety, but also just the, the manner of his wounding right, you have taken this man's eyesight, right, this young man who is, you know, at the peak of his, you know, physical powers, and you have robbed him of something, you know, in that instant that is going to make him, that is going to compromise the rest of his life. Yes, he, no, he didn't die, um, but he will never be the same. Um, and, you know, he, his, what you're looking at is someone who is going to be facing a lifetime of struggle. Um, and among those who signed on to support him, um, Albert Einstein writes a letter, Milton Berle, describe some of what was going on. Uh, is that to me or to yes, Jimmy? Yes, Carrie. Okay. you, Carrie. Um, well, the case, as Jim, Jamila pointed out, you know, the, not only is the, the NAACP looking for um, these types of cases, but this is this has been their sort of MO for a while um, to, to just hold somebody's feet to the fire. Um, just two years earlier, um, there's a famous, you know, an infamous rape case in Alabama that is investigated by Rosa Parks, right? And so they've got this these cases have sadly have this pattern. There is an investigation, something's discovered, NAACP investigates it, and then boom, they begin to mobilize because they can't count on white authorities. And they can't count on, definitely can't count on local authorities to investigate. They have to apply pressure and they're really, really good at it. So, um, you know, as the, as the film shows, there is a, you know, a huge benefit concert that is this star-studded affair with, Jamila, remind me, what, 20,000 people attend um, in the, up in the Bronx um, or in the upper part of Manhattan. Um, he goes on a speaking tour. Isaac Witter goes on a speaking tour. Um, and then, of course, there is um, the public, uh, public publicization by uh, Orson Welles. Um, he makes it a point um, of his radio show to really... Um, you know, turned it into a whodunit because they didn't know, right? They didn't have the name of the police chief at that time. And so it sort of becomes this, um, this mystery that needs to be solved. And um, I had never uh, heard those transcripts before. And wow, I mean, Wells really puts this police chief in the, in the public crosshairs in a way that's, you know, <laughs> kind of dangerous. I mean, not that this guy didn't deserve it, but I was really surprised at how, um, how provocative that was. And yeah, I mean, it was riveting. It was riveting radio. Um, and, and it was a riveting story. 
In addition to watching the film, I invite people to find the Orson Welles broadcast because they really are, it is riveting listening. And he says, now that we have found, uh, when they finally discover that it was Linwood Scholl who was the police officer who was the, um, who, who led the beating, he says, now that we have found you, we shall hold on. We have an appointment. This, you know, very dramatic language that he uses um, to describe how he plans to, you know, hold his feet. Uh, hold his feet to the fire. He's, he's never going to let him rest, right? I'm yeah. going gonna, gonna to be yeah. on yeah. you forever. And he, and he paid a price for that. You know, um, ABC pulled um, their yeah. sponsorship. That was sort of the end of his radio career. Jamila, this is a story about Isaac Woodard, but it's really a story about three men whose lives are brought together. Yes, it's Isaac Woodard, it's Judge Waring, and we'll talk about him in a minute, and Harry Truman. And, and so it's almost like a, a drama that's played out in three acts. And so as Kerry was saying, the NAACP, or as my father always called them, the N2ACP. If you were a, a, a man of color from the South, that's often what you called them. Um, they were very good at applying pressure, but these cases still had to be tried in Southern courts. And that's where we meet Judge Waring. Jamila, tell us about Judge Waring, who was living in South Carolina, but he really wasn't of South Carolina at that moment. Well, you know, he, uh, until his his uh, path crossed with Isaac Woodard, Judge Waring was what you would think of as a as a Southern moderate. He was an eighth generation Charlestonian, the son of a Confederate veteran. He was someone who promoted this idea of gradualism, which was a sort of a, a slow approach to civil rights. Um, but I think, you know meeting Isaac Woodard, seeing Isaac Woodard come into his courtroom that day. And he and he kind of took the case because his colleague, his other federal judge, uh, the other federal judge of South Carolina actually knew Linwood Shull and felt a conflict there. So, so Judge Waring stepped in kind of accidentally. Um, and, and he sees Isaac Woodard and it makes him rethink his entire understanding of South Carolina, the place that he'd spent his whole life and his family had been for generations. Um, he realized that that Jim Crow was a system maintained by violence, period, by fear and violence, and that this is what it does to people. And it was kind of a, a turning point for him. He and his wife, who was also in, in court the day of Linwood Shull's trial, um, they weren't the same after that day. To start with, because of the circumstances of what happened to Isaac Woodard were so terrible, but also the prosecutors made the tiniest effort the, the, to actually bring justice uh, to Linwood Shaw. He, they didn't even seem to try. They didn't call witnesses. They didn't call medical records. They threw basically the case. They, they didn't really want to bring this case and it was apparent in how they executed the prosecution. So he was horrified by what happened to Isaac Woodard. He was also horrified by what had happened in his courtroom. And as a federal judge, there were a lot of things he could do going forward uh, to, to bring change to South Carolina. Um, but the first thing that he does and his wife does with him is undertake a study of race, basically. They realize they don't know the history the way they should, and they don't have anyone in South Carolina that they can talk to and share these concerns with. So they begin kind of a private seminar where they start reading books um, and trying to understand the racial dynamics of South Carolina. Um, and then he starts actively seeking out civil rights cases. And for those who are interested, I, I made notes of what they were reading. They were reading The Mind of the South by W.J. Cash mm -hmm. and uh, Gunnar Myrdal's book, um, An American Dilemma, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and several other books. They, they, they had almost a lyceum, a syllabus that they were following to learn about the South. You can't listen to this and not be reminded of what's happening right now, a case that is so egregious that it stirs the conscience. You can't help but think about George Floyd, a trial that's actually underway now in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, and this case had a significant impact on Judge Waring, but also on Harry Truman, mm -hmm. who, was, who was also a rather unlikely character to take up this cause, given his family history, yes? Absolutely. Um, I don't think the civil rights community that went to him with the case expected this much from Harry Truman, but, um, and, and Carrie would know much, much, she would be able to speak to that much more um, than I will, but he was, 
you know, he was also in a very difficult position politically trying to hold the South together and keep the Democrats kind of in his corner. And Carrie, just reminding our audience that probably knows quite a bit about Harry Truman, but, you know, he comes from a family, a slave holding family. Um, he comes from a family that was, uh, uh, didn't quite like um, didn't like Abraham Lincoln. Actually, his mother had celebrated John Wilkes Booth. Yes. Uh, and so to do something like this meant that the holiday dinner table was going to be rather uncomfortable for him. And yet he did, even though he would pay, face a program at home and likely political peril. Yes, I mean, we all think about our Thanksgiving dinners over the past four years with family members who were we were white be politically at odds with to think about Harry and his uh, mother and his mother-in-law. Um, yes, I mean, he's, uh, he's navigating in some difficult political waters without a lot of political capital. Um, you know, Harry Truman uh, never expected to be in the situation that he was, right? His uh, ascendance to the vice presidency was um, quite a complex affair. Um, and then, of course, with the death of, of Franklin Roosevelt, he becomes, um, uh, becomes president. Um, and he is the leader of an incredibly fractious party, right? The Democrats are a big tent party in the 1930s, 1940s, um, a very unwieldy coalition held together um, you know, by New Deal policies and programs that basically keep race and civil rights at, you know, an arm's length. And because in order to get those New Deal policies, Franklin Roosevelt had to get it through, you know, Southern Democrats in Congress who are incredibly powerful. Um, and so, you know, it's it takes a good bit, no matter what you think about Truman, I think you have to agree he was he had some political courage, right? He um he took a chance. Now it might have been a calculated chance, and we can talk about that, what the calculation was um, as he moved forward, but um it took some guts and it wasn't a foregone conclusion, and things were quite dicey for him in 1948. Um, but I think we also need to remember, you know, that, that uh, as Jamila has already pointed out, and as the film, you know, makes quite clear, you know, he was personally appalled by this, right? It, it, it struck a chord in him like, you know, nothing else had up to that point. Um, and also, you know, he's, uh, he's had a bit of a setback in 1946. The Republicans have won both houses of Congress. Um, so he, you know, he needs to make some choices. And then finally, he's thinking internationally. Um, the Soviets love to use examples like the blinding of an American serviceman to show how we are not, um, you know, uh, the beacon of the world, you know, that we are a nation of hypocrites. And so he's, he's being, you know, pressed on by many sides um, and has many things to consider. Um, but I do think, you know, at his core, um, it, is, it is the lack of humanity that he sees in the Woodard blinding that finally tells him, you know what, I've got to do something. Um, and if I would, you know, just mention something that Jamila sort of reminded me of, you know, talking about the courtroom, I think we forget too about how, you know, the institutions that were in place at the time, not just Congress, but things like the Department of Justice, it just made it so difficult you know, to move forward on these cases. There weren't adequate federal statutes to pursue these types of cases. Um, the civil rights section of the DOJ was tiny with no permanent investigators. Uh, the FBI was led by J. Edgar Hoover, who, was, who thought all civil rights cases were being manipulated from Moscow. Um, to prosecute a federal case, you had to rely on US attorneys who were from the states where they practiced. And to be a US attorney, you had to be well-connected, right? And to be well-connected in the South meant that you were a segregationist, right? So there were, everything sort of had to fall into, what makes the story so fascinating is how, you know, historians like to talk about forces, right? There are economic changes, but you know what? It comes down to people. People in a certain place at a certain time, taking certain actions, showing courage, all of these men along the way 
um, stiffen their spines at the right time to get us, you know, where we ultimately need to go. And that's what I think makes this such a fascinating story and such an important one. And all of them paid a price in some way, Isaac. Oh, yes. Playing the greatest price. Uh, Harry Truman stepped well outside his comfort zone. Yes. Um, putting principle among any kind of polling he may have received, any kind of counsel. Uh, and, and this is a case that clearly moved the needle on his personal compass, on his moral compass. Um, let's listen, Jamila, can you talk us into the bit of tape that we're going to listen to where um, we actually hear from Harry Truman and we can hear um, the, the cogs changing, that he is actually stepping up and shoving America forward with the decisions that he's making. Can you talk us into this clip and then let's take a listen. Absolutely. Um, so Harry Truman um, realizes that it isn't enough to just tackle these little civil rights cases one by one, that the, the country needs to take a deeper look at its problems. Um, and so he's prepared to throw a lot of support at getting that done and, and um, pulls together a commission. Uh, and that's just the first of his many actions. Let's take a listen. By the end of 1946, a racial reckoning in the United States seemed inevitable. Like the Warings, President Harry Truman felt called to respond to the blinding of Isaac Woodard and the mockery it made of the principles America had just defended in a long and brutal war. But political forces had left Truman with limited power to take action against white supremacy. On the same day Woodard's assailant walked free, November 5th, 1946, the president absorbed a stunning repudiation at the polls. Democrats lost both the House and the Senate for the first time in a generation. Forcing the question of civil rights, Truman understood, was likely to weaken the party further. Harry Truman has to deal with political realities. And the realities are that the Democratic Party is an unwieldy coalition, including white Southerners who are staunchly segregationist and supporters of white supremacy, and this new and growing group of African-American voters. Truman knows that any move that he makes on civil rights, he risks alienating Southern white Democrats. But at this moment, when he sees a representative of the United States, a soldier in uniform, Isaac Woodard, who is maimed, it sounds simplistic, but I think something just kind of clicks in him, that this simply cannot stand. We hold ourselves up as the beacon of democracy. We hold ourselves up as moral leaders. Moral leaders do not blind their own servicemen. On December 5th, 1946, one month after the acquittal of Isaac Woodard's attacker, Harry Truman signed an executive order establishing the President's Committee on Civil Rights. The President charged his new committee with laying bare hard truths about the intimidation and violence used to enforce racial segregation and with recommending concrete measures to safeguard the rights of every American, regardless of race, creed, or religion. Harry Truman is a politician, and political considerations are never far from the ambit of a politician's decisions. But there were certain actions he took which could not be explained on the basis of political advantage. He appointed the President's Committee on Civil Rights, I think probably more for moral reasons than anything else. He saw injustice, he was outraged by it. He thought that he should do something. And given Truman's background, it undoubtedly was a surprise to civil rights advocates. Truman said many things that were absolutely racist and indefensible. They were what we would consider of the time for a white man from Missouri. But Truman saw no contradiction between these personal views 
and what he saw as America's legal obligations to its citizens. That it does not matter what you personally feel, whom you would have to your home for dinner or whom you would have a glass of bourbon with at the end of the day. What matters is that these people have rights under the Constitution because this is the United States of America. History is often granular. We study the grand movements of history, but Carrie, as you've noted, it's often those decisions, individual decisions, decisions made um, by a singular person that will have a seismic effect. And we saw that both with Judge Waring and with Harry Truman. Um, Jamila, in Judge Waring's case, when the officers were acquitted and people erupted in cheers outside the courtroom, and as you noted, the um, Justice Department lawyers U.S. attorneys hadn't really thrown their shoulder fully into the effort. He was upset. And he decided that was a moment of reckoning for him. And it really changed the course of his career. Um, and he, he basically made known that he was open for, as we saw in the trailer, bring me a case of consequence. Um, that is an incredible thing for an eighth generation South Carolinian to say, is it not? Oh, it's, it's sort of unheard of. I mean, he, he ended up sort of having to leave his, his home state because he was so ostracized. He was a complete pariah um, in his own hometown for these civil rights cases that he was, he was taking. You know, he, he built up to the, the sort of the big one at the end, which he wanted to take to make a frontal attack at segregation. Um, but he started with with smaller cases, um, equal pay cases, voting rights cases. Um, he desegregated his courtroom. Um, he hired a black bailiff. He did a lot of things that that were considered really strange for the time, but ultimately was sort of tempting people, pushing their boundaries. Um, I think one of one of the big things that turned uh, his hometown against him was he threatened to jail white men for interfering with the voting rights of black people. That made him an enemy of the people, and and pretty much his days in South Carolina were numbered after that. And and he was um, he was also threatened. I mean, we've heard about civil rights leaders living under constant threat. He and his wife were threatened at some point, uh, at one point someone burned a cross in their backyard. Yeah, they were started receiving uh, death threats and hate mail, some usually unsigned, but a lot of them were directly from the KKK. One night they're playing cards and someone throws a brick through their window and, and fires three shots um, at their house and they're, you know, not sure what's coming next. And from that day forward, he had a 24 hour protection from a US Marshal. He was at that time, I think the, the most attacked and threatened federal judge in the country. Carrie, mm -hmm. in the second half of the film, really the last third of the film, the aperture widens and it's almost like watching a chessboard right. because you've got this action in the South in Judge Waring's courtroom. You've got the civil rights leaders that are moving this frontal assault um, both North and South. You've got Harry Truman appointing uh, the, the Civil Rights Commission and ultimately signing Order um, 9981, which of course changed the military along with several other things. Um, help us you know, as we're thinking about this, the, 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 the steps toward Brown v. Board, which was that big case that Waring was talking about. And you would expect that it came from the South, but it's interesting because the decision was made to actually use a Topeka case, which was a bit of strategy in itself. Right, right. So, um, and also within all that, of course, Harry Truman is reelected. <laughs> <laughs> right, um, and, and challenged by, you know, Southern segregations who create, you know, so there's a lot going on um, at that time. But um, uh, he, as Jamil has already pointed out, and as we've talked about, you know, he's doing, he, he's doing the things that he can do, which is, okay, well, you know what, I can do things by executive order. Um, I'm going to, you know, I will desegregate the military, which he does, you know, shortly after he is nominated. Um, as the Democratic candidate in 1948, something that, um, you know, civil rights activists are saying, look, if you, 
if you don't do this, um, we're going to tell young men to young black men not to not to register for the draft. Um, you know, and, and this is, you know, Cold War tensions are at a uh, height in 1948. And so that's no, that's no idle threat. Um, can, I make another, can I just put one yeah. onion in the stew here as we talk about this? Yeah. And in the South, a lot of Black people who were living in the South at that time are party of Lincoln Republicans. So right. he is not even representing people who would naturally uh, matriculate into the Democratic Party. He's got to pull them over because many of them are still voting for Republicans at that point, correct? Correct, correct. Um, so he does things by executive order. He desegregates or he, he says you can no longer um, discriminate um, in the civil servants in civil service. Um, he does things if you are um, if you are a, uh, a contractor, a federal contractor with um, a defense department contract, look, you can't discriminate in hiring. If you're producing stuff for our boys in Korea, you have to do fair hiring. Um, and then he also begins to have his DOJ write what are called friends of the court briefs. Um, the, the, the momentum for the NAACP's assault on segregation um, is picking up steam in 19. Uh, 48 with uh, the Shelley v. Kramer case that says, look, you cannot um, enforce racial covenants um, in housing. Um, Truman, you know, Truman DOJ, you know, signs on to that. Um, they sign on to important civil rights cases in 1950. So, so they are signaling in many ways, right? This is what we are, you know, we're down with all of this. We're doing what we can. Um, and then, of course, um, you know, the, the, the NAACP was taking sort of a, a flanking maneuver to, to basically try to, to crush Plessy versus Ferguson um, and make it too expensive. They tell, look, look Southern states, you want to keep separate but equal? Okay. Um, we know everything's separate. We sure know they're not equal. So, you know what? You need to pay up. Um, you need to provide absolutely everything. And they go from sort of brick and mortar things to things like, oh, well, you know, this school that you've created for this black student, it doesn't have a law review. Its faculty doesn't have reputation, right? They're, they're going beyond sort of things that you can actually purchase to things that, you know, you just can't equalize, right? And making it impossible. And so, um, you know, Truman's Department of Justice all along the way, is, is showing its support. And then of course um, comes the big case, um, which is Briggs v. Elliott, um, which is really an equalization case. It's another one of these cases, but now it's at um, the primary school level, right? Mm -hmm. The NAACP started first with professional schools because um, that involves adults, right? And it also involves the, the fewest number of African-American students. Um, and then finally, they feel like they're ready, you know, to, to try an equalization case um, with uh, primary and secondary school kids. And of course, um, you know, the, the inequality of uh, this particular school system is, is uh, gross, right? Um, it's, it's appalling. And they bring this case and it's going to go before uh, this three judge panel of whom one is uh, wearing. And in what I think is a rather extraordinary thing that I don't know that this would pass muster today <laughs> um, legally, um, but he basically tells Thurgood Marshall, you know what, I don't want another equalization case. It's time, right? It's time for you to do this frontal assault um, on segregation, uh, which is what they do. Um, and wearing, of course, they don't win, um, but they have Waring's dissent, right? That's sort of his final shot to the white people of South Carolina. Um, and then, of course, he leaves um, and he retires. Um, but that's, you know, that's an amazing development. And, and as, you know, I was sitting here thinking about it, one thing that also amazes me about uh, those two men is how old they are, right? I mean, now that I'm an older person, you know, having, having your whole belief system challenged and, you know what, going with the flow and, and allowing it to sort of break down, um, that to me also is a phenomenal thing that not only did they change, but they changed so late in life. 
And, and that is, I think, important right now because we are at a tribal moment in America. America yes. is quite divided. We're at a moment where much of what we read or, or watch or listen to um, because of the siloing of media and news platforms and information systems affirms or confirms what you already believe. So to see a film where there is such um, philosophical drift Right. You know, in someone's life, I, right. I think it's really, you know, very, very uh, I important. Yeah. Um, Jamila, and, and the fact that the case that actually goes to the Supreme Court comes out of Topeka is not the Briggs v. Elliott, but it's actually the Topeka um, v. Board, uh, or Brown v. Board of Brown Education Board. of Topeka. Why was that important? Uh, well, you know, the, the Briggs plaintiffs from, from this small community in South Carolina, they were the first to file. So they, they should, by all accounts, have been the first case, that the, the plaintiffs that we most remember. Um, but you know, we don't exactly know why, but, but uh, certainly Judge Gurgle speculates in the film, the author of the book on which the film is based, speculates that the Supreme Court didn't want it to, to seem like the federal government was once again picking on the South that this was just an attack on the South's way of life and that they could sort of bury those concerns by picking a case from the Midwest, from, from Kansas, which is not part of the South. Um, well, I mean, actually there were um, several cases that were part of Brown v. Board. And so, um, and that was important because, yeah, so there's one from Kansas, there's one right. from, um, you know, uh, Virginia, there's the South Carolina. But the named case was Brown. Yeah. And so that was the one right. that came out. Right. Um, but Which yes, sort of the, the, the non-Southern provenance of that case was absolutely critical. That this is an American problem. This isn't a Southern problem. We have some excellent questions from the audience. And so I'd like to bring the audience into this discussion. Um, you can type your questions into the Q&A feature and I'm gonna try to um, get through as many of them as we can. Uh, Jamila, um, someone wants to know, didn't share their name, but wants to know, was Isaac Woodard blinded for the rest of his life or did he ever get any sight back? Um, we should explain that his sight was, was, was terribly compromised. One of the doctors um, examining said his eye sockets had basically been pulverized. So what, what happened to him, Jamila? Yeah, he was, uh, it was pretty clear he was going to be blind for life within a few days of his, uh, of his attack. Um, I think they, they did have him examined again by specialists after he was released from the hospital. He was in the hospital for several months before, before heading to New York City where his parents had moved. Um, and they brought him to another specialist and it, it was just, there was nothing left to repair. And what happened to the police chief and the person who attacked Isaac Woodard? There were actually two people involved. What happened? Um, so the police chief, Linwood Shull, um, and his uh, deputy, uh, Elliot Long, I believe was his name. Um, they, uh, Shull was tried for a misdemeanor, a federal misdemeanor. Um, and within, and after, I think the jury deliberated for about 25 minutes, after which he was acquitted of all charges. And he returned to the community and was, until the end of his life, regarded as an upstanding part of that community. And it was interesting, uh, researchers, you and I have both talked to members of his family and this was lost to history even within the family. They didn't yeah. even know that, that yeah. this story I mean, existed. That's what's so fascinating about, we see the same thing with um, the, the police chief from Selma, Jim mm -hmm. Clark, who was such a villain and, you know, that they sort of disappear from our collective conscious now among black people who lived in those communities, right? Those men are there, that fear is still there. I mean, it, it lessens over time, but the rest of us sort of move on. And I mean, both of those guys, you know, live really long lives, um, mostly, mostly in obscurity. Um, but it's, it's weird how, you know, they're all over our news and then suddenly uh, they are no more. And that's true of Isaac Woodard also. His case yeah. drifted um, into the back pages and then eventually was, was lost um, to American history. Uh, Darla Tate wants to know, were these African-American men drafted or did they only enlist? Um, it was both, right? I think um, a certain number enlisted um, and, and many were drafted. I think 
Um, you know, two thirds of all African American um, servicemen came from the South. Um, for many of them, I mean, they were, you know, they were patriotic Americans. There were very few examples of um, black men as conscientious objectors or dodging the draft, right? They did their duty. And in, in, indeed, good. many of them were, were interested in enlisting to prove their uh, American citizenry. And that was happening in the war bond effort also, that right. um, Black Americans saw this as an opportunity to participate yes. fully um, yes. in American life. Jamila? I was, I was going to second that and also say that, you know, even though it was segregated at this time, mm -hmm. serving in the military gave them an opportunity to rise through the ranks, to become sergeants, to become officers. You know, they didn't have that kind of opportunity to rise up down there. So, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. serving abroad was was something they wanted to participate in, not just to prove their patriotism, but because it gave them the chance at a better life. Yes. Your economic benefits, yes. Um, did President Truman, and I'm, I'm going to allow you each to take a crack at this. Uh, this is from Brett Creason, who wants to know, did President Truman have courage or a certain stubbornness that relish the fight of something he believed in? Huh. Can I answer both? Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, he was a little, you know, bantam rooster of a man. Um, <laughs> you know, he, uh, he didn't like to back down from a good fight. Um, but you know what? It's easier to fight when you believe in something. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't think he was such a politician that he could just sort of, you know, put on this, uh, put on this cloak and become something else. I mean, he was, he was authentically who he was. Um, so I would say both. Uh, this is, this would call for a little supposition. I'm not sure that, that Judge Waring would allow this in his court because it is his <laughs> supposition, but um, Frank Pollack wants to know, would Roosevelt have taken the same position? No. No, Roosevelt had an opportunity. I mean, you know, the Scottsboro boys happened on Roosevelt's watch um, and he kept civil rights issues at arm's length. And really the only meaningful um, move that Roosevelt makes on civil rights comes in 1941 when he creates something called the Fair Employment Practices Commission, which um, said that if you were, uh, again, of, of uh, uh, an industry that had a federal contract, um, you could not discriminate in hiring. And the only reason he does that is because A. Philip Randolph, who was a big labor leader, said, look, we're going to march on Washington. I'm going to embarrass you um, because there's a manpower shortage. And there doesn't have to be because we have all these Black people who want to take these good war jobs. Um, and that's really, um, really the only thing we can point to with Roosevelt. Other you know, the other thing is, you know, uh, Eleanor was his, um, was his emissary to civil rights groups, and she was very vocal about civil rights. She was very um, public about her support. She, you know, um, opposed segregation when she attended a segregated meeting in Birmingham. She um, deliberately moved her chair between the white side of the audience and the black side. Um, but no, Roosevelt, Roosevelt had his chance, and he didn't take it. Are any of, uh, Jamila, this question is for you. This is from Ann Bailey. She'd like to know if any of Woodard's descendants are alive and the film answers that question, but why don't you tell us about them? Yeah, we, um, we feature interviews with his nephew who was his uh, sort of his right-hand man, his caretaker as in his later years. And certainly as a, uh, Isaac Woodard ended up doing kind of well for himself and, and owned several properties throughout the Bronx and um, his nephew acted as his rent collector and took care of him to the end. Um, and then his great nieces in the film, uh, Isaac Woodard did have two sons who seem to have passed away um, or one of them, you know, we, we can't confirm that he's passed away but he's certainly not, not around anymore. Um, so he did, hit, one of the sadder parts of the story is that Isaac Woodard's wife who he was on his way to meet left him after learning of his blindness, um, but he did remarry and have a family up, up in New York City. Sarah Campbell wants to know if you two could talk a little bit about the NAACP's strategy of bringing test cases um, and their success and how their success varied across states. 
looking for the right case and sometimes bringing cases that they probably knew were not going to be successful. Huh. I'm trying to think of good examples of that. Um, I mean, honestly, I think they were actually quite careful mm -hmm. in choosing um, which cases they were going to prosecute. Um, there were definitely, I mentioned the Scottsboro boys earlier. Um, and, and if you don't know that story, it is a story of nine young men and teens um, who are accused of raping two white women on a train um, in Alabama, and they get the death sentence, and the cases drag on forever. Um, NAACP doesn't want anything to do with the Scottsboro Boys at first um, because they are, you know, working class, poor men, and it involves rape of white women. Um, so the NAACP is pretty, they do eventually get involved, um, but it takes them some time and, and they do it because they don't want to lose that case to uh, communist attorneys. Um, so I think, you know, from, I'm not an, an absolute expert on NC, NAACP legal strategy, but um, from what I've read, I think they choose them rather carefully and they map out their strategy rather carefully. The, the strategy that ultimately leads to Brown v. Board in 1954 begins in the 1930s. Um, and they choose these cases that they think, you know, really, um, you know, they decide we're gonna go after the equalness of separate but equal. Um, and yeah, they choose them, they, they you know, they look for, uh, um, plaintiffs that are above reproach, right? Um, you cannot have something on your record um, because that will, you know, it, then it's going to be over, right? Uh, white people will absolutely uh, attack this plaintiff um, and then the case will be gone. Um, and so I think um, my knowledge of it is that they were fairly successful, um, you know, sort of plowing that field, being very deliberate, right? I mean, it was, it was a 20-year effort just you know, um, attacking Plessy. Um, now they had attacked it for a long time, but just that singular strategy, you know, there was no rushing this. They knew that they couldn't rush it. So, so since we're building out the syllabus and talking about books and films and radio um, excerpts that you might listen to, Patricia Sullivan, who's also in the film, yeah. uh, her book um, actually ticks through some of these cases and actually right. provides a very good explanation of that. Um, just Carrie, before we move on, Jim Woodard notes that you you, you noted that um, Judge Waring may have breached judicial eth judicial ethics when he actively recruited frontal challenges to the uh, South Carolina segregation practice. Um, Mr. Woodard wants to know: Did anyone raise that issue as these cases began to surface? Um, not that I'm aware, and I think I remember from Judge Gergel's book. Um, oh, upon which, you know, this film is, is largely based. I think he said, you know, over time, um, those practices have changed, right? That having, you know, these different types of communications between um, attorneys and judges, um, prosecutors and judges, um, the rules for that have changed over time. So I think what, what was acceptable back then, I think now you would not you would not do. They have to be very careful about who they talk to and where and about what. Um, so to my knowledge, nobody drew attention to it because it really um, wasn't outside the norm. Was Mr. Woodard ever compensated through the judicial system? Was there any kind of civil case brought? There was a civil case brought against Greyhound. Um, it, it was not successful. He was denied disability benefits for... Uh, close to 20 years yeah. um, because he was blinded a few hours after his discharge. Uh, eventually that he was granted full compensation and, and some back payments, but it wasn't specifically for the, the wrong that had been done him. It was just yeah. disability. And is this this case, which has had such a momentous effect on American history, is it commemorated or memorialized in any way in Batesburg near where this happened? Actually, uh, the, the judge who wrote the book on which the film is based on, uh, on Example of Courage, um, Judge Gurgle went to Batesburg and got a tour of the town from the town attorney who was, had never heard of this and 
the mayor had never heard of, of this. And um, they were all pretty, even the Batesburg police force, pretty amenable to commemorating this. And so now um, I actually, in the course of making the film, went to Batesburg and um, there's a marker uh, marking the spot where, where he was blinded and um, the, the building where he was held uh, is no longer, but I think they're, they're talking about putting in a park for him and naming it after him. Mm -hmm. Were there, was there anyone, um, someone uh, who didn't give their name wants to know if anyone tried to stand up for Mr. Woodard? There were other soldiers on the bus that evening? It happened pretty quickly and out of, largely out of sight. So, so no one that we know stood up and got off the bus with Woodard. Um, the police officers dragged him around the corner, um, mm -hmm. but a couple of them did see the, the officer shell getting pretty uh, rough with him, but, but no, the bus didn't stay till the attack was over. But they did give, um, and I know you talk about this in the film, they do give um, affidavits later. They get, you know, people mm -hmm. track him down and they talk about what they saw on the bus, which of course completely counters what the bus driver says happened. And then sort of what they were able to see before he was sort of hauled away by Shoal. Judge Waring left South Carolina. He moved to New York, lived in an apartment with his wife. Um, they entertained um, Black luminaries in their home on a regular basis, which was something that was really not done quite often in the 1950s. What was his relationship like with Thurgood Marshall going forward as Thurgood Marshall's um, star continued to rise? You know, I think Thur Thurgood Marshall had crossed paths with Waring before the Isaac Woodard case and uh, remarked that he was the only white judge who ever treated him fairly in court. Um, you know, Thurgood Marshall wasn't quite ready to move as quickly as Judge Waring wanted him to, who Judge Marshall had been incredibly careful building this record of cases and Marsh and, and Waring's sort of telling him the time is now, do it now was, you know, really risky. He could have lost all those years of building a record mm -hmm. uh, to attack segregation with the equalization strategy. Um, Waring retired in the uh, 19, in, in uh, 19, the early 1950s. And Thurgood Marshall continued his work. Um, and there was some, we don't go into this, but there was some tension between Walter White and Thurgood Marshall. And Walter White was, was Waring's best friend, basically. So I think there was, there was a mutual respect and Waring watched Marshall's cases intently, but he was really cl much closer to, to Walter White. Mm -hmm. And Carrie, Pe Peggy Brown wants to know um, if this was an isolated case. It absolutely was not. Mm -hmm. um, she wants to know if there were other incidences um, that were covered at least uh, in that period in Black papers or if not nationally where returning Black veterans were met with violence. Indeed. Um, one that comes to mind, which um, they were talking about on the Sunday news programs because it happened in Georgia, was the case of Maceo Snipes, mm -hmm. um, who is uh, from Georgia. He's an African-American veteran, 1946. Um, and Georgia in, in, <laughs> remains an interesting case now, was an interesting case then. Um, essentially, the gubernatorial candidate at that time was a, a virulent racist named Eugene Talmadge, um, who essentially said, look, the way to keep Black people from voting, and there were a lot of Black Georgians that were going to vote, um, is uh, through racial violence. I mean, he was really quite upfront about what he wanted white voters to do. Um, Maceo Snipes uh, votes in the Democratic primary, and a few days later is shot dead on his front porch. Um, about two weeks later after that, there is something that's come to be known as the Moores Ford lynching, uh, which involved two couples, two African-American couples. Um, and one of the women, I believe, was seven months pregnant. Um, and one or maybe both of the men were veterans. Um, and they were, uh, they were killed by uh, their employer. And a, and, a, and a group of men, which included law enforcement, um, these, that case in particular was investigated by the DOJ, um, but no indictments um, came down. 
uh, Columbia, Tennessee, um, in, you know, also in February 1946, uh, there was a two-day race riot. Um, hundreds of people involved that started, you know, like most of these things do, and all, you know, just a, a disagreement um, that just, you know, lights the fuse. Um, and there, I believe federal, there were some indictments. I don't think anybody was convicted in that case. Um, as, you know, the president forms this committee and as the committee is, you know, doing its business of, you know, investigating the status of Southern, well, American race relations, but really the South, um, there's a lynching of an African-American man in South Carolina that actually does go to trial. Strom Thurmond, who, you know, nobody would ever accuse him of being um, a, liber a liberal, but he does um, call out the state FBI. They round up, you know, 30 some suspects, um, interrogate them. There's a trial. Um, and of course they are, you know, they're let go as well. Nobody is, nobody is convicted. Um, so these things are happening in real time as the president's committee is trying to figure out, okay, what kind of safeguards do we need? Well, you know what, we need all of them because we have none of them right now. Um, and it was, it was just distressingly common. Uh, Jamila, two last questions from our audience about Isaac Woodard. John Hunkler wants to know if Woodard lost one eye or both. And Denise Goner wants to know, did he get a pension eventually from the military? He did lose both eyes um, and he did eventually get his pension. When Harry Truman signed Executive Order 9981 to desegregate the U.S. Armed Forces, the military then had to do that. They had to follow suit. And um, there were a series of directives that went out to the commanding officers. And um, I've had a chance to read some of them. And one of the lines really struck with me. They were basically telling people, we can't tell you what to think, but it's the military, so we can tell you what to do. Mm -hmm. And to do anything less than what we're asking you to do, which is to allow men to use all of their talents and all of their efforts and all of their muscle on behalf of America, to do anything less than that is tantamount to material aid to the enemy. Mm -hmm. Do we need a message like that today in a divided America to understand that our divisions um, undermine our effort to reach our full potential, both as individuals and as a country? I mean, I, I would certainly think that you have to set the bar somewhere. Um, you can't sort of, ch I, I, you know, I think Thurgood Marshall said it best, which is the law doesn't have the power to change men's minds, but it eventually over time can change their hearts. You, you tell them what is the baseline um, and, and you basically set a standard to which they have to, to meet. Um, Harry Truman did that, the Brown v. Board of Education did that. You can argue about how far we stray from that standard, but the standard exists now and it needs to. Harry? Yeah. Um like you, I, I read some of um, the responses of, you know, the brass and the military. And, and one thing that, you know, Eisenhower said was, well, you know, you can't force people to like each other. This ain't about liking somebody else, right? This is about equality under the law and, you know, protection of the laws. It's about the 14th and 15th amendments um, that for too long um, had been hollowed out. Um, and I think, you know, if I've learned anything being a historian and teaching Southern history, you know, going back to Reconstruction, is that you absolutely need to tell people what to do. Um, you know, you, we have that power, right? We have that power vested in various levels of government. Um, and if, you know, if, if, those rights and those protections are not enforced and backed up, right? We're not going to have them anymore. You know, that that's exactly what happened at the end of the 19th century. And, you know, I don't want to end on a, on a sad note, but I, 
you know, this feels sadly familiar, um, sadly familiar. We're just gonna take one more um, question from the audience, from an audience member. And then I have a final question for you before we close out. Uh, Cam Teo or Teo, and I apologize if I've mispronounced anyone's name tonight. He wants to know what political price did Harry Truman pay for his support of Woodard and the NAACP and his decision to integrate the armed forces? Um, I don't know that, I mean, he was reelected or he was elected um, in 1948. He, he could have run again in 1952. He chooses not to. Um, but it's not for either of those two reasons, right? I mean, it really more has to do with what is happening in Korea um, and the sort of fortunes of that conflict that um, just, you know, we're not going well. Um, but I, I don't, I, I think the, in the short term, yeah, he's challenged by white Southerners, but Clark Clifford was right said, look, they're going to hoot and howl and you know, be angry and they might even stage a protest. But in the end, they're going to be safely democratic. And they are. They come back. They eventually leave again, right, and, and ultimately become Republicans. But um, politically speaking, you know, he, I don't think he pays a price for it. I think it, I think it, was, it was the right thing to do. Um, he doesn't get his civil rights package passed in Congress, but he knew that that was a long shot. That's never really what this was about. It was about doing what he could do, the sort of the art of the possible. Um, and I think in the long run, you know, it absolutely was the right thing to do. Jamila, we always hope that history finds the right conservator. And we're very happy that this history found you to make sure that more of us learn about Isaac Woodard, about Judge Waring, and about President Harry Truman. What do you want people to take from this film? First of all, thank you for such a kind thing to say. Um, you know, I think what I want people to take away are, are a couple of things. One, you know, the story kicks off with, with a guy who's just standing up asking to be spoken to with little respect. It's a small action and it throws into motion these really seminal events. Um, and followed by people who all have to take varying levels of, of courageous acts uh, from Judge Waring to Harry Truman to the, the plaintiffs in South Carolina who face incredible reprisals to get themselves a school bus, which is also a pretty small thing to want in the scheme of things. Um, so I think that, the, that these small actions, just standing up for what's right and what's fair can have enormous impact. But also, as we're living through this moment where we're having conversations about police brutality and about violence and against Black people, uh, to see that, that this is something that has been going on for so long needs to change how we understand our current moment. That this isn't just a new thing. It's not just that we have recorded evidence of it now. It is something that we really have to look at because it has been with us for centuries now. Jamila Efron, Carrie Fredrickson, thank you so much for joining us. I hope that everyone who joined us this evening finds time to watch this film tomorrow evening. Um, it will be uh, airing on PBS. Check your local listings to find the time, um, the correct time, uh, depending on where you live. If you are active on what my mother calls the Twitter, um, you can also follow along on the hashtag Isaac Woodard PBS. It's always interesting to see Twitter historians watching or Twitter historians watching in real time and sharing their thoughts. I want to thank everyone um, from the Truman Library Institute who helped pull this program together and all the work that they do continually to uh, lift history up and to educate us and to inform us. And I hope that this story of Isaac Woodard and the sort of snowball through history involving Judge Waring and, and Harry Truman will make its way into more school curriculums. I hope that more young people hear about this. I hope that this is a story that many more people will know about talk about um, and, and share with their loved ones. Thank you so much for being with us this evening. My best to both of you, my best to all of you. Um, please stay safe and be bountiful. <laughs>